Hello, welcome back. We're going to continue um, analyzing the quality of the financial statement. Uh, here we're going to pick up on the asset side. We just look. We just finished looking at liability. So for asset, um, we need to um, what what makes a balance sheet item high quality. So once again. We want to emphasize that we want to be able to use the balance sheet to help us assess liquidity risk and solvency. Um, so, in terms on the uh, on the asset side, some um, some items are relatively straightforward. Cash is cash is cash, so there's not a whole lot of problem about measuring them. Um, Cash that are restricted for um, long-term purposes. Um, so here's some exam uh, example: uh, bond sinking funds or uh, restricted for or uh, earmarked for planned ex uh, for investments. Those should be included in the non-current asset portion, um, even though it's still cash. Once again, you don't have a problem measuring those. Um, accounts receivable should be measured at fair value. Um, and again, depending on the um, nature of the firm, uh, and there are and that's why we use turnover ratios to look at how healthy is accounts receivable. If days in accounts receivable is relatively long compared to other um, other uh, firms in the industry, that will be a cause con for concern because we we are not as certain whether or not those are, are collectible. Uh, inventory, um, again, depending on the nature of the business. Um, let's say you're looking at a grocery store that has a very high turnover, then inventory at the original cost is probably appropriate. Um, if a company is in distress, um, let's say a car company, um, then a uh, an old inventory, you know, a car that has been um, was produced five years ago, uh, and you already have two new models. Then the value of that inventory uh, may deviate significantly from its original cost. So here's typically what we do when we are trying to account for a non-current asset. Um, usually. Um, you record it at the original cost, and then you will probably either um, use a fair value, um, or um, if you need to make um, depreciation, you will reduce the value of the firm based on accounting rules. So what happened here is we're going to use um, depreciation, which will um, be, which is an expense, so they'll reduce income to recognize that the value of the of the asset has declined. So when we first purchase a non-current asset, um, the value is focused on um, the va the value that the the asset can generate for its from its future use. It also Need to make um, when we recognize the value, we also need to um, ensure that the future economic benefits are probable. So, an example of that would be acquiring a patent. So, acquiring a patent, um, that patent is only valuable if you are able to um, translate that into future revenue. Um, if the patent is useless, then you cannot um, recognize the value of that patent um, based on your acquisition cost. Next, let's take a look at income. So we had talked about earnings management. Um, so typically we have sales minus cost of goods sold and that uh, and selling administrative expenses that brings us to operating income. And one of the very important part of separating earnings is uh, or understanding earnings quality is separating from the operating versus financing versus invest, investing activities. But then we have all these additional items such as um, referral activities, restructuring, and um, all these 
um, other other um, items. Um, all these affect as is considered as income from continuing operation. And this is an important um, distinction from income from discontinued operations because when we are trying to forecast the future profit of the firm, these items that are after operating income but are still part of continuing operation requires more attention. You know, sales, um, sales, cost of goods sold, SGNA, those we know will always continue. But will this recur on a regular basis? Will peripheral activities, restructuring, would this recur on a continuing basis? And should we incorporate them into our forecast? So that's what we're going to take a look at. So here are some um, special events. You already, we already mentioned gains and losses from peripheral activities. For, so what we need to do is look at, we need to look at from year to year, are these recurring? Um, are these peripheral activities a relatively consistent? Um, also restructuring charges and impairment, um, they are considered part of continuing operation. Um, so once again, we want to look at um, are they, uh, how persistent are those? And then other uh, discontinued operation that, you know, by definition should not be part of um, estimating the future. Um, and then we have other comprehensive income. These are important. So a lot of these have to do with fair value gains and losses. So we have fair value gains and losses on investments in debt securities, um, fair value gain and losses on derivatives, um, and then adjustment to pension. So if you can change um, either because of interest rate changes, um, that can be, that will lead to changes in pension value. Uh, foreign currency adjustments, again, fair value gains and losses due to revaluation. So all these are important to take into account. Um, and this is also where sometimes our earnings management can occur. And then finally, changes in accounting principles and estimates. Um, this is much more obvious. Um, but changes from these items is a lot harder to detect. Because they're harder to detect, let's take a look at how we can uh, find them. So here's an example. Checkpoint system is um, um, they make infantry tracking systems. So this is what they put out in a press release. And our job is to calculate the amount of, based on what they put out in, uh, in a press release, um, what the amount of impairment and restructuring charges are. And we also can talk about why did the firm choose to report more than just net earnings. Why do they also report um, earnings excluding impairment and restructuring charges? Okay. Here are the information we have. So I encourage you to um, open up your own calculation. This is relatively um, straightforward. So here's what the company reported. In year four, they reported net income, net loss of 29.3 million. In year three, they have a net income of 4.5 million. On a per diluted share basis, the net loss in year four is 78 cents. Uh, in year three is an income of 13 cents. But if they exclude impairment and restructuring charges, the net income excluding this is actually for year four is actually 30 cents higher than um, year three which is 27 cents so we can compute um, how much those charges are okay so let's take it so first we can compute how much the Im implied impairment and restructuring charges are on a per diluted share basis so um, excluding is 30 cents, so we subtract the two, 
um, this is after. So it's actually um, a dollar eight if uh, the amount of impairment and restructuring charges. So it because it reduced earnings from thirty cents to a loss of seventy eight cents. We can do the same thing here. It also in year three it also reduced the earnings from twenty seven cents to thirteen cents. So the amount on a per diluted share basis is a um, dollar eight per share in year four and fourteen cents per share in year three. To figure out the total amount, um, we need the number of shares outstanding. Uh, we know that net income or loss is um, 29.3 million, uh, but on a per share basis is 0.78. So to get a per share basis, we know we need net income divided by number of shares. So to find the number of shares, we will divide net income divided by net income per diluted share. So we take net income divided by the per share value. That gives us the number of shares. Um, so we didn't round this up, um, but we'll just keep it. So it's about 37 shares. Um, and it's about 30, 37 million shares, and this is 34 million shares. So if you multiply the per share, uh, per diluted share impairment and restructuring charge by the number of shares outstanding, we get the total amount of um, restructuring charges. So in year four, the total amount is about 40.5 million or 40.6 million, and in year three is 4.8 million. And of course, um, because this is such a large amount and is um, very different, um, it, what they what management want to show is that um, net income from their operation uh, is actually relatively stable and actually increase. Um, it is the restructuring and impairment um, charges that brought down their um, their earnings for that year. So it's not surprising that management want to show a um, a better picture. Another important item to look at when we uh, try to evaluate earnings quality and to, to try to detect earnings management is to look at the accrual component because that is, uh, again, a legal and very common way for management to try to manage earnings. So if we separate um, earnings into its ca operating cash flow and accrual components, we'll see something very striking. So we'll see that um, companies that net income scale by the assets. So you will, when you have uh, low accrual firms, they'll actually reverse and high accrual firm will also reverse. So, um, so when you, when we see that net income is high relative to, um, operating cash flow, um, We'll have the firm will will have recorded income increasing accruals, and because accruals automatically reverses, they will eventually come down. When we have um, firms that have low, when net income is low relative to operating cash flow, the firm is having income decreasing accruals, um, and the Again, this will also reverse in future years. Finally, we can take a look at how analysts evaluate these uh, accruals and how does it affect their forecast. As you can see, um, this is their forecast error. So when firms use income increasing accruals, um, so they have high accrual, analysts tend to have a higher error. Whereas low accrual, which is up, actually not very common um, because it is income decreasing, uh, and analysts tend to have lower errors. So this, this indicates that analysts sometimes may be affected by, um, by uh, management manipulation, um, 
or that um, or the other way to look at it is that um, analysts overestimated those. So um, you can argue that management is um, manipulating earnings to try to meet analyst expectations. So how do we put all these together? So let's take a look at a company. This is Sunbeam Corporation. Um, so we're going to take a look at um, the statement of cash flow and see whether or not we can detect um, some patterns and some red flags that we need to pay attention to. Now, we didn't have the statement of income. Uh, usually, we will have all three financial statements and we evaluate them jointly. But even without the income statement, we see that both accounts receivables and um, inventory are decreasing. So that's a good um, there's a good hypothesis that sales is also decreasing. If you look at the, state, uh, uh, the income statement, we would actually confirm that, yes, sales is in decreasing. Um, you can also see that um, there, there may be a working working capital management problem here because the increase in accounts receivable and inventory uh, definitely outpace the, um, um, the decrease in accounts payable and other current liabilities. Another potential problem is that it's, um, cash flow, that is investing activity far, far outpace is cash flow from operation. Now that may happen in one year when the firm is expecting uh, is expanding, uh, but this is happening consistently for three years. We also saw see that uh, it sold some businesses, but also acquired other businesses. So it it looks like year five they were trying to do some. They are trying to change direction or change strategy of the firm. Another important thing to look at is, once again, having cash flow from investing um, higher than operating uh, cash flow from operation is not always surprising because a firm that is growing would typically be investing more than it can generate. But let's take a look at how they finance that. Um, it looks like they are financing most of the short four by short-term borrowing. Uh, these are long-term, these are fixed assets. They are using short-term borrowing to finance long-term investment. That's usually a red flag because a firm that is healthy, they would typically be able to finance that by borrowing, so either long-term debt or easing, and, and, and um, that will be more likely than short-term borrowing. So that's another red flag. We saw that its net income went from positive to negative in year, from year five to year six, and then back to positive in year seven. But taking a look at those additional information, we see that the majority of the losses was a result of restructuring and impairment. So it looks like the company is trying to invest in asset, uh, writing off maybe old manufacturing facilities and trying to change direction. And we see a significant increase in accounts receivable as well as inventory. Again, if you have the um, the income st statement, you'll see that sales actually went up quite a bit in year seven, which is fantastic. Um, however, you still have a negative cash flow from operation. So uh, income is increasing, but cash flow from operation is decreasing. Um, that will be concerning, particularly if you look at how much increase in inventory, and that is not supported by a corresponding increase in accounts payable. So that may indicate that the company is having trouble getting financing from its suppliers, um, and that is not a good sign. So um, in addition, it continued to um, use short-term financing in year six to finance its, um, its investments in assets. And then in year seven, it finally issued common stock to, uh, again, issuing common stock is a, um, um, a last resort. So that can have a diluting effect. So all these are items of concern that you can pick up from looking at um, a statement of cash flow.
we'll end this video here. In the next video, we're going to look at a model to help us detect the likelihood of fraud to help us um, better estimate um, accounting quality. See you soon.